Hey everyone, WSCW's Rick Antonio here, just from the State Street Bridge going over the Titabawasi River at the moment. Just wanted to show everyone how the water levels are going at the moment. I'm on the west side of the bridge, just at the spillway, just past Midland Road. This is right up at the other side of the State Street Bridge. And again, this extending all the way through many of the other Saginaw County overpasses and bridges to get over the Tittabawassee River. You can see where the bridge is at, and crew workers are saying that water levels are expected to go up another four or five feet from where it's at now. Welcome to this episode of The Media's Input. I am your host, James A. Paxson. To check out this interview and previous interviews, go to the YouTube channel, James Paxson. Episode 14 was with Peter Moore, who is a sports writer, sports podcaster for Cool AM over in England, covering soccer, tennis, cricket, all of the above. Go check out that interview at the YouTube channel, James Paxson. And today, episode 15, we have another WSGW partner of mine, Mr. Rick Antonio. He is a news writer he is a podcaster he does the roundup nightly on 790 news radio wsgw rick how are we doing buddy great hot toasty <laughs> just one of those weeks and july has been full of them it's getting a little too hot for me mm -hmm. and I, it, it would be nice if it would cool down just a little bit just just a bit <laughs> what have Maybe you been doing since the coronavirus hit um Personally, what I've been doing, a lot of staying home. I mean, life hasn't really changed. I mean, moved into a new place in February, so I've been dealing with more of that than actually going out and enjoying things that have been cut off, essentially. But outside of that, work hasn't really uh, – I've been one of the few deemed essential to go into to the building to work. Um, so I've been at the station since the beginning of this. I'm guessing it was a little eerie a little bit when you go in and you're like one of the only people there. Eerie and uh, eerie and peaceful at the same time because now now everyone's coming back into the building. Everyone has to wear masks. You got to be careful on what you're doing. And uh, before it was just make sure you use hand sanitizer. Don't touch anything that someone else might be using. And it, because you were the only one in the building, didn't necessarily need to mask it up. But I mean... It's still a still a good thing to do when you're walking throughout the building. Yeah, it's uh, you still got to be safe and everything, but you mm -hmm. know, hopefully, people just wear the mask. Unfortunately, because there's a lot mm -hmm. of people in this world who don't want to wear it. And that's the hardest part is people aren't wearing them in public, which it, it that's honestly been the one thing I have been sticking with. I might be talking about not wearing one at the work building, but yeah, I wear one at the work building, and since the beginning of this, I've been wearing one out in public. So. <laughs> It's, it's it's just wallet, keys, mask sort of thing. In the Saginaw area, when you go to the store, what percent of people do you think are wearing a mask? Oh, geez. Don't even get me started on that. That's uh, There's a good percent of people that have been, but there's also a larger amount of people that have not been, which unfortunately then I've, I've had a couple of teleconferences with the Saginaw County Health Department. They've been saying you got to wear the mask. It's, it's not, it's not the hardest thing in the world to do. And if, uh, if you wear the mask, the cases might be even less than they are now. And Michigan has been listed as one of the states with the lower numbers, lowest numbers, uh, lowest, I forget what they're calling it specifically now, what Michigan's at. I've been scattered, scatterbrained the last two weeks, but um, I'm thinking that more people wearing masks wouldn't be the worst thing? No, it would definitely be a good thing for more people to wear masks. And you would think that it's not that hard of a thing to do. And it, it kind of irritates me that people think it's like a freedom thing when you're just trying to protect other people. A lot of people are thinking it's just a fashion statement too, just to look at the other side of it. You got people going out there that are wearing uh, I know something's better than nothing, but I mean, you got people going out there wearing things that you wouldn't be able to even consider a mask. It's just, you're wearing that for fashion. So, so there, there's two sides to it, but 
when it comes down to it, you got to wear one just for safety. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to push one way or the other, but just at the moment, it's not the worst thing to do. No, I definitely think it's probably one of the smarter things to do and just wear it. So hopefully it can cause less cases and cause less deaths, but more importantly, it's not that hard. It's just, just put on the mask. It, that, that's, and that's, that's the whole, that, that's the whole thing is it's not that hard to do. Absolutely not. You and I, we started working together at WSUW over a year ago, and you were started working there a couple different years ago. Talk to me about, you know, your education, your professional history, and how you got to be a news reporter. Um, do you want it from the very beginning, or do you want it from just the beginning of news reporter? Go ahead, the very beginning. I mean, the very beginning, you, you really want me to go to the beginning of the broadcast career. Went to Olivet College my freshman year to play football, blew out my shoulder, and uh, just one day went to the cafeteria and uh, the little fry and burger joint they had underneath the cafeteria was right next to the radio station. And, you know, one thing, follow the cute girl into the radio station. Uh, next thing I knew, I had a show. <laughs> Don't know what happened to her, but <laughs> uh, and then after that, I ended up transferring to Saginaw Valley. Uh, joined in with Cardinal Radio there, the Cardinal Radio uh, online group they've got. Um, helps a whole bunch of different aspects of that. Managed to get them into a new studio, get them a whole bunch of new production equipment, um, get them into the green instead of, you know, in the red or well, what is it, in the black, not, not, the, not the red. So they actually started making a little bit of uh, stability. But I couldn't have done that without the team that we had because that was great. Um, that's where I started getting more and more into talk radio because I wanted to do more of a podcast style show as opposed to just an all music show like they had most of. Uh, at that point in the area, I was looking for jobs in media, and uh, one of the well, one of the options that had responded to me was WSGW. And they said, hey, we're looking for, uh, looking for a board op for uh, various different things, run some Tigers games, run, uh, at the time, I think it was the one year that they were set to do Lions games, and that really got me hyped. But um, yeah, the Tigers game sealed me in, the, the, the night hours that I was doing, I was doing overnights 10 to 5, which was really helpful for getting homework done and really helpful for getting a lot of school-related stuff done and uh, just really sort of helped me focus on what I wanted to do because every, every, every other day, uh, you either got the guy before me, the guy after me coming in saying, Oh, what are you thinking about doing when you graduate? And it really made me think. <laughs> and then eventually when it comes to the point, uh, of graduating, I was talking to, uh, the boss man about what, what I should be doing when I graduate. <laughs> Uh, graduated with a communication and a criminal justice double major. And uh, uh, I think at that point we had determined that if I had gone into reporting, that would potentially either lead into a full-time position or that would either lead into uh, w work experience as a reporter for a potentially different media outlet. But uh, every job in the area that I was finding in media said you need at least to have a year or two in uh, news reporting so that's where that came from and eventually I caught on a, a bit you could say I mean you got other experienced reporters that had been there for 30 40 years so <laughs> you compare my work to them you're probably not gonna see the difference but I, I like to think I've grown into my own just a little bit <laughs> um, and then it just sort of stuck from there I, very first thing that I covered uh, very first piece was my own graduation December 2017 so and then fast forward to now you got uh, you got the virus you got the protest you got uh, the flooding that's the whole different ball game now really have to step it up for some of the stuff recently what um, did you learn the most being at Saginaw Valley and working for Cardinal Radio working for Cardinal Radio I learned that it wasn't all about me I learned that it wasn't just it wasn't just the Rico show. It wasn't just the Rick show, or it, you had have to work together as part of a team. And uh, up until that point, uh, I, I'd use the word selfish. <laughs> it's like, oh well, my show, my thing, my whatever, my topics. 
But then uh, after working with the crew there, I was learning that uh, you got you got to be able to work as part of a team. Otherwise, no one's going to like you. <laughs> Who has helped you the most in your career so far? Oh, my. That's that's a tough one. That That's a... Um, I... In terms of getting into news, I would say that'd be a combination of uh, Dave Maurer and Ann Williams. News director Ann Williams, uh, program program operations manager Dave William uh, Dave Dave uh, Maurer, and then uh, learning more production tricks. There's got to be a uh, uh, former operator for WSGW. You got Bill Anders. You got all of our crew now. I've learned a bit from you. <laughs> I've learned from you. I've learned from everyone that's still on staff now. You got Charlie Rood in production and uh, other other reporters. We got Michael Percha and all of them. So just to give shout outs to all of them is just great because they all deserve it. They're all great people and they've taught me so much. From my experience working at WSGW, you learn something different every single time you go to work from someone. Oh, that's, that's an understatement. <laughs> that's an understatement. Do you remember one of your WSGW moments where you're like, this is it. I'm glad I'm in this career. One of your more successful moments. Oh yeah. No, uh, I mean, I've got the stuff recently, but one of my first situations like that, there were uh, two coverages, two bits of coverage. Uh, the very first one I think was at the next year automotive plant in, is that considered Bridgeport or Saginaw at that point? Uh, Governor Gretchen Whitmer. I got to, got to interview her and see what was going on there. And uh, that was sort of like, okay, wow, you're getting to meet some of these big wigs and uh, you're meeting them up close. They're not un, not untouchable. I mean, they're, how do I word this right? <laughs> they're, they're just people. And it sort of showed that uh, you, you, you get to meet people like that. You could potentially meet them every day and you start getting into city council and the mayor and all that sort of stuff. You talk to all of them all the time. So it just sort of makes it a smaller world, kind of. It makes it all that much easier to sink into the job. Do you, when you interview, you know, the mayor or the governor compared <laughs> to another person who isn't as popular as they are, do you interview them differently or do you try to interview everyone the same? I generally try to interview people the same, but that really depends on what the topic of why we're there uh, what the topic of why we're there is. Uh, if we're going in to ask about the roads, then I'd ask the governor in a certain way than I would against, uh, say, the mayor talking about, oh, there might be a circus coming to town. Who knows what? I mean, just, um, <clears throat> and as you get to know the people more and more, like I was saying, you know, you get the governor or you get the mayor, you get city councilmen. Uh, as you talk to, the, talk to these uh, politicians, these people more, you get more personable with them. And uh, I got to say, just for people on Saginaw City Council right now, I know like uh, uh, Clint Bryant's running for the 95th district here in Saginaw or uh, in, the, in the state. Uh, great guy. I, I've met him dozens of times and just, he's just, uh, I, usually my motto is don't trust a politician, but that's kind of hard to say when you actually know the guy. <laughs> You know, try to stay sort of middle of the road on all these things, but uh, yeah, that's that's sort of like, well, how do you not talk to one of your friends, sort of thing? What has been the biggest event you've covered so far? Oh, biggest thing I've covered. Going back and thinking. <clears throat> biggest thing I've covered. At that now that's just because there have been a several decently sized things in the last couple of months. Uh, I might be a bit short sighted in saying this, but I mean, we've we've had things going on in the last three months that have been massive. I mean, you've got coverage of the flood, you've got coverage of uh, the of the virus, and coverage of the uh, the Black Lives Matter protests. I would say, out of those three, they're all massively important things. Um, I would say the, the thing I was most uh I don't I don't want to say worried about going into was the flood. The the Midland flood that happened uh God, is 
it had already been a month and a half. Um, because that had been my first field assignment since the, since the virus had hit. And uh, there were going to be dozens, hundreds of people gathering in one area. And I was, I was all covered up. I was probably wearing, I was surprised I didn't get heat stroke then, but it was only 50 degrees out. <laughs> I was just all covered up trying not to touch anything or touch anyone or talk to anyone too closely. And uh, just the, the, the dollar amount in damage is millions at this point. I, I think uh, the city of Midland's dealing with quite a chunk of change on that, but uh, all of the, all the homeowners that are out of homes in the Sanford and Midland areas along the river, you got people down in Saginaw along the river, Saginaw Township, uh, just either out of their homes dealing with massive damage, just uh, you got people filling in their basements now. And uh, important wise, I would say locally, that would probably be one of the biggest things. Uh, I, I would say that the, that the protests are right up there with that, though, because there's no way to discount what's been going on nationally with, with these Black Lives Matter protests. And uh, again, you got to stay in the middle journalistically. Um, you you got to look at it from both sides. Someone going into an event like that, you see all these... Uh, attention grabbing headlines. Oh, people are throwing bricks. Oh, people are shooting rubber bullets. You got to be a little concerned getting into that too, but that's where you got to give Saginaw credit because they were one of the peacefulest protests. Uh, I would say in the country because there were hundreds of people gathered outside the Saginaw County courthouse and they were amazing. They had a beautiful message of just trying to unite against, against, uh, against the wrong, wrongdoing and, it, it's. I think that speaks for itself on how important that is. News-wise, what did you learn about covering the floods and the protests? Uh, the floods and protests is that yeah, there might be something big going on in the world in reference to the to the virus, but uh, when you, when you put it on a smaller scale, people uh, people are able to come together. People are able to. Uh, work together regardless of race, regardless of income level. And I say income level specifically because you got different housing uh, situations in Midland. Not everyone's in a big mansion. Yeah, people are stereotyped in Midland. Oh, they've got more money, whatever. But uh, not, not everyone's in that situation up there. Um, and then you get the protests coming in. You got black, white, Hispanic, Asian, all at this same protest, not like uh, older protests. And that's what some of the... Uh, advocates that had, that had a chance to speak were saying is that they're glad to see the diversity in the protesters at these events. So really it's a, I'm, I'm learning from these events recently in the area that working with people, just like I was saying with Cardinal Radio, you got to work with people. How hard is it to keep your bias out of what you're recording, whether it's some- incredibly, <laughs> incredibly, um, and it's, I would say one of the hardest things about reporting and typing these things up to go on air is trying to keep the fluff out of it, let alone the bias. Um, I mean, the bias, if you, if you report on just the facts, it's not that hard. If you actually talk about what's going on, instead of putting your own opinion into it, it's easy. But when you're at these events, and uh, you've been hearing someone say something on TV for weeks on end, like I was saying with the governor, with the attorney general, and I've had a chance to speak with the attorney general as well. Um, it, you hear him on TV weeks on end on different messages. It's like, oh, I really hope I don't say the wrong thing in front of this important person. <laughs> you know, does something sputter out just the uh, oops. But uh Do you remember, yeah, it's, it's, uh, go ahead. Do you remember any of those wrong time moments where you may have said the wrong time in the wrong place? In person, I've, I've got to say in person, both in person and on air, I'm very lucky to say, I don't believe I've had any of those moments yet. There you go. Fingers crossed. Knock Thanks. on, knocking on some, knocking on some wood. I don't think I've had any of those moments yet. Um, there might, there might have been a joke I cracked about the animal shelter going in. I forget who I made it to about, uh, oh, you're going to put it right next to a famous Dave's Barbecue house. Mm, but I think that, 
that was that was very off the record and of course now it's on the record so whatever there goes my career <laughs> that's uh, one topic in the city of saginaw you really don't want to bring up and that's the animal shelter no yeah the animal shelter that issue's been going on for a long time and i'm really glad that they did decide on a site uh, a lot of people were upset that it didn't end up getting chosen in the city because the city was honestly offering free land on this matter but they determined putting it it was the Saginaw County Animal Control Shelter not the Saginaw City Control Shelter so there's that argument and then they put it in a, a quote-unquote higher traffic area which is understandable because you want to get the animals out of there if you have a higher turnover on the animals then you're not going to have as many in the cages if they're keeping them in cages I don't know what they're keeping them in anymore so the, and then that's another way to sort of keep a bias out of it is try to look at it from both sides. I know you're a huge football fan. Oh yeah. At <laughs> so I guarantee you have some thoughts on Patrick Mahomes and his new contract, whether he deserves it, whether you think the chiefs won or Patrick Mahomes won. Oh, or- Patrick Mahomes won for sure. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the chiefs won cause they get Patrick Mahomes locked up for 10 years, but I mean, what, what did they end up saying after every single incentive? $503 million. It's $140 million guaranteed. Guaranteed, yeah. But incentives, it could this dude's going to play lights out for the next 10 years. Well, do you see any decline in his game? Um, he's a more agile quarterback. I don't want to call him a mobile quarterback like we've seen other quarterbacks. I mean, you got Michael Vick, Colin Kaepernick, uh, Tim Tebow. You see how all three of them fared out. Uh, the team started seeing how they played and uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of other running quarterbacks nowadays <clears throat> outside of Mahomes. I'm just worried that they're throwing all this money at him before teams figure out his game. And the only, the only situation I can think of where teams haven't necessarily figured out a guy's game is Russell Wilson. I definitely think, in my opinion, the top two quarterbacks in the league are Russell Wilson and Patrick Mahomes, and it goes about how great they are running the ball and how great they are passing, but they both can throw very accurate on the run. So and it, that's the thing. Yes. It's where they're both very good when it comes to when they're in a bad situation and the pocket collapses and it looks like they're going to get sacked or they need to throw the ball away. <clears throat> it's pretty easily that they could find someone open and throw it accurately on the run. And that's where, that's where Detroit quarterback Matthew Stafford's been in my eye is he's good on uh, freestyling it. Yes. Freestyling. Uh, overall as a team, you got to work on it, but Stafford generally speaking, isn't too bad at that. No, Stafford's been pretty decent when it comes to that. And that's where, I think he won't get the credit he deserves, but I don't exactly know if he's a top 10 quarterback anymore. Yeah, I don't, that's, uh, unless you got the puzzle pieces around you, it's really hard for anyone to be a top 10 quarterback. I mean, uh, to say Tom Brady at this point, even is a top 10. I mean, he, he's, he's certainly up there and he's certainly got the, he's got the skill. He's got the touch, but uh, Tampa Bay. Yeah. I, I would go with no. I mean, he's definitely one of the best all-time, maybe the best all-time. But at the moment with his age, how last year went, I would go with no. He's not a Look at it this way. Joe Montana had a very decorated career with the San Francisco 49ers. We don't talk too much about his Kansas City Chiefs years. Yeah, that's, it's going to be the same <laughs> thing with Brady, I think. I hope not. I hope he goes lights out. I hope they have that dream team that Philly joked about having – forever ago but I mean you get Rob Gronkowski to come out of uh, retirement I just hope they don't drug test him every other week because he was lighting it up every other uh, interview he was in in the offseason we'll see what happens to Tampa Bay but more importantly you are a huge Lions fan and what do you think the future looks like for your Lions you know do you believe in the coach do you believe in the general manager what what are your thoughts I want to believe in the coach I want to believe in the general manager I want to even believe in the owner now that Martha Firestone Ford has handed it over to her daughter. Um, I've always thought the Ford curse was sort of a thing after Bobby Lane's curse ended up rolling out, but you know, curse after curse, there's only so many excuses you can make. Um, Stafford was great. 
Calvin Johnson was great. We had a couple of running backs mixed in there that were great. But as these names start leaving the team, as they all start going their own ways, it's getting harder and harder to defend them as a Lions fan. You just sort of start rooting for them as your hometown team, and they get as far as they can go, and then you catch on to the <clears throat> catch on to the skill players at that point. I mean, I couldn't I couldn't tell you half of their defense right now. <laughs> well, are you still a Stafford believer? Oh yeah, for now. Well, let's see. Uh, let's see whether his whether he he put the team on his back so much that it actually broke last season. So. <laughs> How much longer would you give Matt Patricia without reaching the playoffs? Matt Patricia? Uh, let's see. How long has he been with the team now at this point? He's going into his third year. And how third much longer year. would you give him without making the playoffs? Well, my question is how long is his contract in the first place? I believe it's five years, but we'd have five to Five years. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not giving him his all five, year, all five years if he doesn't make it to the playoffs. Even making it to the playoffs as a Lions coach is kind of a, 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 st a badge on the chest, I guess, but that's kind of hard to uh, gauge with any Lions team. I mean, you got um, Jim Caldwell, who was in here, and they managed to get, I believe, once or twice during his earlier years. Uh, so do I, do I want to go all the way back to Jim Schwartz? Probably not, but coming out of 0-16 – that was the right direction. Um, yeah, that's for sure. It's one of those where I think for Patricia, this year it's got to be, you know, I don't want to make it cliche, but playoff or bust. If you go three years without making the playoffs and it doesn't look like you have a good forward direction, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is the – this year, if he doesn't make the playoffs, I don't think this is a get fired in the middle of the season situation. If he doesn't make the playoffs this year, it may be an off-season move. They may hang on to him into the next season and can him into three or four games if they start tanking early into the season, early into the season sort of thing. But I I see him at least sticking around through the through the regular season this year. And don't take me on that because everything with the Lions lately has been <laughs> just as crazy as 2020 has been as a whole. So at the moment, you're at WSEW, and mm -hmm. where do you think your future holds? What do you plan to do with your career? Now, that's a tough question for me to answer because I don't want to step on the toes of anyone that's there currently. But at the same time, as people advance in their careers, as people, uh, I mean, you got people that have been in the business uh, 40 years or so, and uh, most of the people that have been in the business as long as they have been uh, have already retired or stepped down or have other uh, situations have come up. Uh, long term, long term, I would hope to stay with with the company as long as possible because I've seen how long people can stay with this particular outlet. I mean, when you when you got uh, one, two, three, four different people at one point that had been with the with the company for at least thirty years, that's a really good sign. So that means stability. That means it's not a bad gig. So, other people's futures aside, I'd like to stay with the company. <laughs> uh, looking forward, when other people make their own de de career decisions. Um, that's hard to tell because I've sort of put myself in a position. I've worked with the right people to be able to spread out and branch out into different directions. If something opened up with an on-air show, I would, I would hope to be at least in consideration if things opened up. Uh, I, I don't I don't see what more could open up news wise, uh, but I would be game to stay in that direction, I, anchoring possibly more often, uh, uh, production-wise. I mean, I mean, it, it's really hard for me to say all this without trying to name people directly without stepping on any toes because that's the hardest part about all of this is I really love all the people that I work with. And that's what the hardest part of the virus has been is I haven't been able to see most of the people that work for the station. I mean, we've got you. Uh, we've got Rob Robinson, who has been in the building. He's been he's filled in for me several times. He's filled in for uh, 
and he hasn't filled in, but he's been doing work with uh, Kiss 107.1, uh, our R and B station. Uh, I mean, we've got our other port, uh, we've got our other part-time uh, board operators who help with the sporting events because James Paxson can't run everything at the same time, <laughs> as much as he'd like to, and as much as I'd like him to. But um, it, it, that that's really the hardest part is determining a career outlook without stepping on other people but uh there i've had i had a discussion with someone the other day is sometimes that's what you got to do where can people follow you on social media and where can people hear and see what you're doing with wsgw uh people can hear and see what i'm doing with wsgw on 790 and 100.5 fm uh, 790 am 100.5 fm from 5 30 to noon on any of my uh uh reportings Usually it's uh, usually it's Dave Maurer, Michael Perch, and Ann Williams doing the morning bit with anchoring. Uh, when it comes to me anchoring, I could be any of those times. I could be any, anywhere from 9 a.m. to noon to 3 p.m. to 7. Who knows? Uh, at that point, that's just a matter of catching me on air. Uh, 6 to 7 is the uh, evening roundup, the weekday evening roundup. That is a for sure you're going to hear me unless once in a blue moon you'll catch Rob Robinson. Um, social media, I've been trying to find, uh, I've been trying to streamline everything, uh, Twitter, uh, Twitter is Rick Antonio on air, Twitch, Rick Antonio on air. Um, I believe my Facebook is Rick Antonio on air. You can hear the landscaping outside. They're working on getting things straightened out, but <laughs> as, as the background noise increases, it's starting to, you can tell what's going on. Um, yeah. And then you got just the Rick Antonio Facebook page and uh, as goofy as that sounds, having a Rick Antonio Facebook and my own personal Facebook, it, it's just sort of a way to keep up on the times. I mean, I've been sharing every bit of information that WSGW posts, just in case you're one of the few people in the region that doesn't want to follow WSGW specifically on some matters for some reason. I don't know why, but, um, yeah, I've been sharing all of their information as it comes along, <clears throat> and uh, I'm I'm working on getting a steady podcast going. It's been project after project. I've got three or four different things in the pipes at a time. So uh, my main focus at this point is just making sure my news reporting is at the top of its game as as top as it can be. <laughs> anyway, so um, how was your Fourth of July? Now that I'm assuming we're probably near the end of the questioning of myself. I figured I'd throw a curveball your way. Fourth of July was great. I was up north at Houghton Lake with the family, and the weather was perfect. No rain in sight. It was beyond the water, especially since it was 90 degrees, and fireworks yeah. were going crazy, even though there was no planned fireworks in some of these places. But people certainly went and mm -hmm. bought them, that's for sure. Oh yeah, no, that's, I was with uh, my girlfriend at her, uh, her uncle's place. I, I swear to God, he had four or $500 worth of fireworks that he went and got just to shoot off in the backyard. <laughs> uh, I've got, I've got stories of the whole weekend, but I don't want to, I don't want to run you too long. Just... Well, I appreciate that, Rick. And thank you for the question. I do appreciate you mm -hmm. asking me a question to check out this interview and previous interviews. Go to my YouTube channel, James Paxson. And as always, thank you to the guest. Today was Mr. Rick Antonio. Thanks again, James.